would like to welcome all of you here um, today to the estate planning webinar. Um, really excited about this, uh, this webinar. Uh, we've got a great turnout um, and I'm excited about that because this is, this is information that I think uh, everybody really needs. Um, young, old, middle of the road, um, I think everybody kind of needs this, uh, this information so that they, they understand estate planning um, uh, well enough so that they can determine, you know, if they uh, need to put together a plan. I think really everybody should have some sort of a plan uh, put together. Um, there are certainly different levels of different uh, estate plans, um, but uh, somebody should, or everybody should have some level of an estate plan put together. Uh, joining me today, uh, I am Jeff Brindley. Uh, I think pretty much everybody knows me um, on the list that I saw. Um, but joining me today, I've got special guest Mark Landau. Mark is a, a estate planning attorney. He is in Farmington, in the Farmington area, and um, that's all Mark does. Mark specializes in estate planning. That's all he does. He is an expert in that area. And um, it's just wonderful to be able to have him here today, Mark. Uh, thank you for joining us. Now you're welcome. Thank you. So let's get started. I always like to start with a, a cartoon. This one's a little bit long in the tooth, but um, I like this one because it uh, it uh, uh, says a couple different things. So if, if you can't see this, it says, with Thanksgiving around the corner, I thought this would be a good time to review my estate plan. And um, kind of gets a little bit of a chuckle, uh, but also I think it 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 shows me two things that people don't um, people don't think about estate planning until generally until they're in their fifties. Um, it's just something I don't know whether it's because they don't think they have enough assets, or if they think that they're getting older and getting closer to retirement, or what it is. But really, estate planning, uh, like I said earlier, is for all ages. Um, and I would say maybe even a little bit more important um, when you're younger and you have maybe some young kids, if something, God forbid, should happen, you want to make sure that you've got your estate plan in place. Um, so I'd like to see more younger uh, people um, uh, coming to these, um, but really it's needed for everybody. It really is. You know, Jeff, on that point, if I, if I could just jump in, I mean, so yeah, please. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, really 100% because of COVID. Um, a lot of times people can wait. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they have that feeling they can wait to, uh, you know, some, some later time <laughs> to review. But um, over the past year, you know, people are just concerned. I mean, the, um, and so we, we've seen uh, a lot of activity uh, just to review what is written. Uh, even on the simplest things, even on the medical power of attorney. Okay. I, and so we've seen, um, you know, a, a lot of interest, uh, you know, because because of COVID, because people see it's, uh, I mean, it's real stuff. Right, right. And I think you make a good point there too that even if you have a, a estate plan, it's it's good to review it every once in a while. Things change. Huh. Um, things change, and I've 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 seen where you know, um, people have uh, 25, 30 year old kids now, and they still have grandma as the. Uh, is the person that's going to take over the kids if something should happen. So, um, so it's good to uh, it's good to review on a regular basis. Yeah, for sure. So the workshop today: um, introduce, educate, and illustrate. Um, we do a lot of educating here at uh, RWS Financial Group. In 2019, before the uh, before the pandemic hit, we uh, did over 200 live wow. seminars in Michigan alone, and so. We do a lot of education, and um, so we're, we're trying to do a lot of it uh, uh, virtual now. Um, but as things uh, start to break with COVID, we will uh, certainly get back to having live seminars again. And, you know, I just want to mention, too, it's, it's, it's just an honor to have all of you um, here today. Again, I think this is great information. Even if you have a, a, a trust and an estate plan put together, um, I think this is uh, good and, and updated information as well. So our commitment is to provide sound financial information, help you identify goals. So we're gonna talk about various goals that you might uh, uh, be able to, uh, to work on. 
um, offer, uh, offer a complimentary consultation. So at the end of this seminar, we will, both of us will offer a complimentary consultation. Those of you that have worked with me in the past know that you just pick up the phone and give me a call and um, you know, let's talk a little bit about whatever issue that you might be, uh, um, you know, might be in front of you. But the same thing is true for Mark. Mark is uh, at the end of the summer is also offering a complimentary consultation. You give him a call, he'll set up a time and absolutely free, you know, you'll have a consultation with, uh, with an expert uh, estate planning attorney. So we're gonna have that at the end. So don't race off um, at the end. Uh, hopefully you can stick around for a few minutes. And Jeff, on the uh, you know on the legal, I think yeah, the financial side. I mean, we're we're reviewing clients' documents all the time, and uh, you know, there's a lot of peace of mind even when we review it. If there's if there's no change, and obviously there's no no cost to that, but there's there's peace of mind. Uh, you know, we like to say on our side, um, if it's been more than three years since you've reviewed your estate plan, it's good to pick up a phone and just run through it. If there's no change, then you sort of had a cup of coffee. There's no change. If there's a change, then we, we run through it. But um, I think there's a lot of peace of mind just uh, you know, running through what has been written just to make sure it's up to date. Right. And, you know, it's, it's funny because people ask me what kind of what business I'm in. And sometimes I'll uh, just tell them I'm in the peace of mind business because um, I can give people a peace of mind that somebody's watching over their finances um, for them, and uh, they really don't have to worry about those things. And if something should come up, it's just a phone call. You know, I'm a phone call away. So we really are in the peace of mind business, I think. Yeah, I think so. So um, we've got uh, some lessons um, from the rich and famous. So I, I look at the rich and famous, and I'm thinking, geez, you know what? These guys have all the ability to set up an estate plan. You know, cost is not an issue. Um, you know, they've got the opportunity to set up an estate plan. And yet, um, in many cases, it just doesn't happen. Um, so uh, here again, rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Um, you really should have some sort of an estate plan put together. So a um, couple of case studies, Aretha Franklin, no will or estate plan. And may, maybe, you know, with Aretha Franklin being in this area, um, you may have heard some of the, uh, some of the horror stories that have, have uh, taken place. I think she's, um, her estate is rolling up on, uh, two years. Um, she had no will, no estate plan. They did end up finding something that was kind of, uh, written down and signed. They don't know if it's real. Um, there's a big battle going on. So she didn't have any of this. Um, could take years to settle her estate. Again, it's it's. I think it's coming up on uh, two years uh, uh, so far. So she didn't have anything put together. Um, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson did a little bit better. He put together a living trust, um, but never funded it. And this is like one of the number one things issues we see that a trust is put together, but it doesn't get funded. And we're going to talk a little bit about funding, what that means um, today. Um, but that's, you know, one of the places where people fall down all the time. And um, with Mark and myself, we make sure that, in fact, that trust is funded like it should be. So, um, uh, so having an unfunded trust is like pretty much like not having a trust. Um, so Michael Jackson's... Um, uh, estate went through probate and his will was open to the public. And you may say, geez, you know what? That's not an issue for me. I'm not famous. But if your will is open to the public, anybody can go in there and take a look at it. Um, they can call you up because they know something's going on. Um, they can call up, uh, you know, um, uh, beneficiaries, um, whatever you really don't want that to, to, to be public. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can avoid that. And Jeff, you know, as to, as to that point, I mean, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. There, you know, we always have to connect the dots, which means, you know, draft the right document. Uh, and number two, put the assets in the trust. I, I know you and I 
you know, work real well together and to make it easier on the client. We, we have a checklist. Please do A, B, C, and D. And uh, with you and I working together, makes it easier on the client because you just get the checklist and then, then you do the stuff. Right. That way the assets get in the trust. And um, for sure, uh, at the time of death, when the assets are in the trust, it's, a, it's kind of the reason we're, you know, we're in this business in the first place. It makes it easier on the family, and, and, which is really good when there's very, very little to do at the time of death. Right, right. That's yeah, exactly. how I coordinate our work together to uh, make sure the assets get in the trust. It's, you, you have to do both. Right. Like a, yep, I agree. Yep, exactly, yeah. So another case study, Robin Williams. Um, Robin Williams did a little bit better here again. Uh, he had a $50 million estate. Uh, had a couple of trusts. Where Robin Williams um, seemed to fall down a little bit was uh, those things that didn't have any financial value, but they had um, emotional value. So his kids and his wife ended up fighting over things that had some sort of an emotional value. He didn't address those things um, in his estate. And so um, here again, you know, you end up with a battle um, because uh, uh, it just simply wasn't addressed. He did much better though. He had, he had trust set up and, and everything else, but uh, that was one area where he really missed. And then Joan Rivers, $150 million estate. Uh, end of, she had an end of life directive. So her daughter, I'm trying to think of her daughter's name. It escapes me at the moment, but her daughter, had the, the end of life directive so that she could make, you know, it makes it easier to be able to make that decision if you have an end of life directive. My mom had an end of life directive and it made it easier for me and my siblings to make the call um, when it came time. Um, I can't imagine without that, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what we would have gone through. Um, the other thing she had, she had trust, she had provisions for her pets. She had everything covered. She had the whole whole ball of wax. Everything was covered uh, with for Joan Rivers. So, you know, different people handle it different ways, but um, certainly it's important to have something set up. You know, Jeff, the biggest issue on the end of life directive, and I agree, and we've all been there. Um, the real benefit is to have a statement. It's it's completely not easy, but it makes it easier compared to a parent whose children have no idea how they feel, um, that's really hard. So to have a statement, I mean, that's what we do, um, to say this is how I feel is hugely important. Uh, the biggest issue here, and it, we, all, we ask this squarely to the, uh, you know, to, to the parents, let's say they have uh, three children. The biggest issue, and it you know, re requires the question and a discussion, is should you make all three children be involved on the medical power of attorney? Should you have one or two? Uh, many times what we see is clients will just say, well, I'm going to just pick the oldest child. Uh, I'll pick the child in town. But sometimes, you know, you and I don't want to be the only, if there's three children, you and I don't want to be the only person on the list. Maybe it's easier to make it all three. Right. I mean, that's what these meetings that we would have are, are about. But right. I think the key point is what you said is to have something and then select who maybe all the children would be implementing that decision. But it's a great point. Mm -hmm. Good. So here's what we're going to touch on going forward. Principles of the estate uh, concert or conservation, fundamentals, challenges, basic distribution techniques. Um, so when we're talking about distribution techniques, we're talking about distribution at time of death. But we're also, I'm at least also talking about distribution when you go into retirement. How are you going to take your income over time? Um, we, we, we have a tendency to think of estate planning as just when you pass away, but I see it as also uh, managing your estate while you're alive. You know, let's, let's get some, uh, 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 some enjoyment out of this, but also Let's make sure that uh, we're taking distributions from your IRAs and things of that nature in a prudent manner. Yeah. So.
um, real important. Yeah. So what is an estate, all the wealth that you have accumulated during your lifetime? Um, that's pretty much what an estate is, pretty simple. <laughs> right, uh, where some people kind of uh, don't think about it, uh, the estate completely includes the life insurance, even though that's kind of a death time, you know, based on death, it is part of the uh, assets that pass. So uh, addressing the uh, amount of your life insurance, I know, Jeff, that's what you do, but that, that's a huge thing, especially with a lot of people who have IRAs. You know, that, as we all know, is, is subject to income tax. So having enough money for your spouse and your children knowing the IRAs are maybe 70% money after the income tax, you know, the amount of your life insurance and making sure it doesn't run out is a, is a huge question that, you know, Jeff, that I, I know you will address and it's all, it's all part of this. Right, right. Real important. So two goals of estate conservation, manage assets during your lifetime, which I talked a little bit about, and then also distribute <laughs> assets upon your death. And um, so those are the two main goals. Um, and so it, it's not, it's not complicated, um, but generally you need to have somebody walk you through some of these questions, um, you know, going forward. Uh, benefits of estate conservation, select who will receive your assets. So who the asset's going to go to. Determine distribution of the estate. How is it going to be distri distributed? Sometimes it can be done over time. Other times it can be done as a lump sum. And I think I'm gonna get the sun here in my eye and here in a few minutes. <laughs> um, choose individuals to manage the estate. So you wanna choose somebody that has the ability to manage the estate. Not only the ability, but someone that you trust. So um, that takes a little bit of thought. Uh, may take, you know, if you're a couple, um, it may take some thought uh, between the two of you. Who do you want to manage? And some, some couples will say, you know, this person's going to manage this piece and this person's going to manage this piece. So you want to have somebody that um, has a little bit of uh, knowledge that is not intimidated uh, talking to an attorney, um, you know, and just being able to manage um, the estate overall. Um, and then help reduce settlement costs. You know, that's, uh, that's a big advantage of uh, uh, setting up an estate plan and choosing gu guardians for minor children. Remember I said that uh, really you should have an estate plan um, in your younger years when your kids are, are, are younger. If God forbid something happens, you want to make sure that the, the appropriate people are um, going to be taking care of your children. That's real important. Um... The question that comes up on our side, if you want, you know, let's say a brother, sister to be a, the guardian, uh, do you also want them to be the trustee? Many, many times the answer is yes, because you trust you know, your, you know, the guardian with the money. But sometimes it's nice to have uh, both sides of the family involved and uh, have someone be the uh, guardian and other people be the, uh, the trustee. So it, it's a discussion item. You know, there's not an agenda, it should be one or the other, but it's a, a question that comes up uh, every single meeting. And then the last bullet point here, provide uh, liquid capital for burial, settlement, and, and income tax costs. Um, some people, you know, forget about that. Um, that you, need, uh, you need a little bit of cash to take care of those things. For other people, you know, that's the main thing, you know, to take care of the burial and the settlement costs. So. Um, it's, it's different for each individual. Right. Uh, so go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a huge thing. Uh, you know, some people have real, real, real estate. Um, we mentioned IRAs, uh, you don't want to have to be forced to sell an asset the next day or distribute the entire IRA to, to pay for expenses. So you, you hundred percent, Jeff, Jeff, I know what, it's what you do is, uh, make sure there's enough liquidity, uh, to take care of the uh, settlement costs for sure. Right. Mark, did you want to talk about the actual documents here? Yes. Um, so the power of attorney, it's a very common document. 
but even in a common document, there, there, there could be uh, differences. Uh, and what I mean by that, you know, the power of attorney, you know, it, it takes us 10 pages to get there, but it basically says, here's who could sign my name if I get sick. If you don't have a power of attorney, you know, let, let, let's say uh, you're selling your house and, uh, you know, one of you, uh, husband or wife are sick or a single person sick, whatever it is, no one legally can sign your name. That, that if you don't have a power of attorney, that spells probate. Okay. Uh, and so you definitely want a power of attorney. The most, you know, common question in the power of attorney is if you're sick, who should sign your name? And again, you get the question, if there's multiple children, uh, it may be easier to have all, let's use the example, three children, it may be easier to have all the children and not pick and choose. I'm not saying it is for any one family, but what happens around here is that if you just say, I want this child and not the other, the other children feel bad you know, why they left out. So I'm just saying having the dialogue is important. You and I 100% need to do, Jeff, as we have here, the, the medical power of attorney. And something, please, please, please remember, it's not only you and I need the medical power of attorney, but if there's uh, someone in your family who's age 18 or older, you know, I mean, there's no war stories here, but you, you call an adult child, someone age 18 or over, you call their doctor, their doctor is not allowed to share medical information with, with you. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're the parent or that, that, that doesn't matter. So as much as you and I need power of attorneys, medical power of attorneys, so do your children. Yeah, they, anybody 18 or older, ah, if they end up in the hospital and can't, they can't speak for themselves, you can't speak for them legally. Right. Um, uh, so my daughter, you know, my daughter's 28, my son is 25, They're, neither one of them are married. They don't have anybody to speak for them unless I have that medical durable power of attorney. It's funny. We'll uh, talk to the parents you know, about their estate planning. And then sort of at the end, we always bring it up, you know, we, that we need to do a medical power of attorney for your children. So the thing that they remember is, is that we asked about their children and we were concerned about it and that it's an easy thing to do. You basically just press another button, um, <laughs> but it's a good button to press. And hopefully you never have to pull it out, but it's a good thing. Uh, the will and trust, we'll be talking about this more, but uh, I wrote this down on my sheet and you could uh, you know, write this down, you know, next to will, put probate, wills go to probate. Trust, I wrote down no probate. So uh, no one would knowingly say, I love probate and sign up for just a will, okay? You would want a trust to avoid probate and as Jeff mentioned, you know, the assets have to be in the trust. A trust is like a bucket. Jeff would work with you to uh, fill up the bucket. But those are the, uh, you know, the, the main documents. Okay. Thanks, Mark. So now we're going to jump into challenges. You've got uh, various challenges. Even attorneys can be challenges at, at sometimes. <laughs> taxes, long-term care. So one of the things I just, I, I mentioned um, earlier that uh, Mark is an estate planning attorney. You need somebody that's, if you're going to get an estate planning attorney, you need somebody that's qualified. That's all they do. You don't want to call up the attorney that um, just got your son out of jail for a DUI and say, you know what? together my estate plan you know I, I heard I heard from Jeff he says we should do that you know you really want to find someone that is that that's all they do is estate planning so um, familiar with all aspects of the state administration and willing to work with other professionals like financial advisor um, and Jeff, you can I ask for mention that, that I think the the parts that you mentioned here um, there's probably, so clients are comfortable, uh, there's probably 15 of us in the estate planning uh, area here in our, in our firm. I mean, there's 35 of us all together. But, uh, and so uh, I'm saying that, uh, and Jeff, you know, you, this slide says it perfectly, but uh, it's not only, there's only half of it. 
uh, is to prepare the right documents, which we do. But the second part is when we're across the table, as, as you are, you know, from a surviving spouse, uh, you know, with children, that the estate gets implemented properly. And that's a whole other aspect of estate planning that, uh, you know, we, we've seen it. And so that's real important. And we're, you know, we're experienced with uh, the right people here. Uh, and I think the coordination you mentioned is the only way it works because it doesn't do the client any good if we prepare the documents and go home, okay? The assets have to be funded and working with Jeff for a long enough time, uh, Jeff will not stop until the assets are in the trust. And that makes it really easy when there are surviving family members when there's very little to do. So I think it's it's very important that your team is is you know knows each other and it, it coordinates their work together. So um, so another suggestion here is to ask for referrals from friends, financial professionals like myself. Um, but here again, once you get that referral, you need to ask the, the right questions of the of the um, of the attorney to make sure that they are qualified to be able to put that. Uh, uh, put that estate plan together for you. Court proceedings, probate, court proceedings that uh, conclude all the legal and financial matters of deceased. That's what probate is. That's, that's all they do. Um, and uh, generally speaking, you want to avoid probate. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's okay. costs involved. There's, you know, uh, paying for a lawyer to, to walk you through probate. People are poking into your matters. Um, is every, everything that goes through probate is is public, um, and I'd rather not. Uh, uh, I'd rather not have people poking into my public, you know, into my into my private matters in public. Yeah, uh, you know the public part. Um, I mean, it happens. Uh, people see uh, anyone could see that your estate is whatever size it is. And all of a sudden, because your estate, I'm just going to say it was a million dollars. I mean, it, be, it doesn't matter the amount. But all of a sudden, uh, someone makes a claim uh, because uh, you know your estate's large enough. But uh, if it was uh, in, if it's in probate, it's public. If if it's uh, if you avoid probate, that doesn't even come up. So no one. The point uh, we made a little bit earlier it says it here too. No one knowingly wants a simple will to go to probate. Yeah. And the public part, I think, is is probably the most damaging part. Okay. The other part is probate can take a long time. We saw yep. from uh, Aretha Franklin, you know, she's two years in yep. and they're, they're not anywhere close. Um, right. Uh, um, a lot of probate is straightforward. Uh, I mean, the point is you don't want to be in the first place, uh, but uh, if, if you are in probate, the bottom line is you and I don't have any control over the process uh, because it's public. People make claims uh, and that uh, it could take a, a lot of time. The key is you and I don't have any control. That's just not going to happen in our trust. Right, right. Well, that's so, what the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so here's, you now. you know, I mentioned earlier the um, Michael Jackson's will was public. Here it is right here. It's public information. Um, you can look it up. You can Google it. You'll be able to find it. Um, and so... Um, again, you just don't want these things to go uh, through probate because it's going to make everything public. So, so Mark, you want to talk a bit about this a little bit? And I do have a, uh, yeah, just go ahead and yeah, you, can you can talk through this. Yeah, I think what this means is a practical matter. And I'm saying these, these are on documents we've prepared. Uh, it wasn't so long ago, maybe even 10 years ago, um, that the exemption was 600,000 a person or a million two together. Um, and so we had to prepare, you know, the textbook documents we prepared had a lot of uh, tax provisions with the exemption being at 11.7. And it's really, there's a new concept as of just three years ago uh, uh, that each husband and wife uh, have an 11.7 we call it 22 million, 23 million exemption. Uh, the, the practical result 
is basically no one pays estate tax anymore. And the practical result without the estate tax, uh, the uh, administration, if the documents are updated, can be made much easier. So it's just a real opportunity to make things easier. There's all kinds of discussion on the 11.7 going down to 5 million. Actually, that's, that's the law in five years from now. But the 5 million is 10 million, which still means for you know 99% of our clients, uh, state tax is just not going to be an issue. It makes it easier for an update. So that alone should be worthwhile to come in because easy is really good around here. And that's, that's really the effect of that slide. Mark, I did get a question on the uh, Q&A, um, and um, they were asking how long something can be in probate. Uh, we know that with uh, uh, with Aretha Franklin, it's coming up on two years. Again, it's you know, it, you know it's going to be longer. Um, any thoughts on that? Have you seen yeah. anything that uh, you know just went on and on, or? Yeah, I think uh, there's no deadline on this. Uh, what it happens is a practical matter uh, that let's say the estates, whatever size, doesn't matter, but there has to be an accounting. The beneficiaries have to consent to the uh, accounting. So let's say, um, you know, the beneficiaries do not consent right away to the accounting. There's questions. So you get that extension of, of time uh, in, in probate. The main point, I think the main point, is that we lose control of the process if we go to probate. That would not happen in a trust. Right. That's the main point, you just lose control. And, and somebody that's not even related could put a, could uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sub, uh, do a challenge. Uh, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, uh, you, yeah. know I, you know, this, this guy was, uh, he promised me, he promised me he was gonna give me you know, a hundred thousand dollars when he died. <laughs> right. The, so then that's a challenge right away. And then they have to go through the proceedings to try and figure out, well, is this a real challenge or. Right. Right. The, and it just becomes, it, it's very uh, stressful. It's yeah. really what it is. That, yeah. uh, and the reason they make, uh, you know, the challenge is because it's public. <laughs> that's the starting point. Yeah. You kind of lose control. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so you want to talk about this one uh, too, Mark? Yeah, uh, you know, in the old days, pretty quick. Yeah, just yeah, in the old days, which was three years ago, there there used to be uh, you know various uh, you know the, the textbook way of drafting the documents would be uh, not not to give hundred percent to the spouse uh, because to do so would potentially cause an estate tax. Now, with that exemption so high. You, uh, it's it's uh, almost 100% common uh, to transfer assets to a spouse because uh, it makes it easier and there's no estate tax. Right. It's, right. E it's the easy part on that. Yeah, a little easy button. Yeah, right. Uh, it, which gets to this slide too. It's not only easier, but uh, what this slide is saying, the step up in basis, if there's, you know, if you know, let's say someone dies, uh, you know, 10 years ago, and the assets, uh, you know, you know, appreciated in, in, in value. Uh, assets appreciate in value at the date of the first death. In the old way of doing things, which was three years ago, the appreciation between the first death and the second death did not get a second step up in basis. So if a million went to a million five, and then the second spouse died and the children sold the assets, there'd be a $500,000 worth of gain at 20%, that's a $100,000 cost. Now, because of the prior slide and the high exemption, you could get two step up in basis, which in that example uh, would save the family $100,000 in tax. All right, All right. So uh, the focus is exactly on this in estate plans. It's a good slide. So what we're talking about here is a step up in basis, like a home. Um, a home would be a step up in basis if you pass that home on. Um, what they mean by step up in basis, let's say you bought the home for 100,000, but now it's worth 200,000, you pass away, your heirs will get that home at full value without taxes. 
and right. so they'll be able to they'll be able to take that step up in basis. Now the government is talking about, and the same thing is true with stocks. Let's say you bought uh, uh, you bought uh, Apple, and we'll see a slide on that here in a second. But you bought Apple, you know, at a very very low price, but now it's gone way up. If you pass away and you pass that uh, Apple stock on to your heirs, then they get a step up in basis. They get the full value. Um, the government's talking about taking this away in the future. So the other thing that's, that's always very important when you're working with an estate planning attorney and a financial advisor is they keep you up to speed on all these different rule changes. So if a step up, if the step up in basis is taken away in the future, then we have to find other strategies that will help you, um, you know, with dispersing your, uh, your assets to your heirs. Um, so let's uh, try and keep things on track here as far as the timeline is, is uh, concerned. Um, so when carryover basis, so I just want to mention this, that carryover basis means that the appreciated assets would be subject to capital gains, which could be as high as 23%. So the step up in basis is is crucial when you're um, deciding whether you should take those assets for um, for your own uh, income, or maybe that's an asset you should hold on to and pass it on to your heirs. So, you know, it's important um, that you understand uh, step up and base. Here's the Apple stock example. You know, if you bought it down here, but it went up to here and you wanna pass it on to your heirs, you know, that's maybe something you should pass on. Right, to, right. To compare it to gift in it to, during your life because that would be the carryover basis. Uh, so you want to own, you want to own assets that are appreciate because the gain right now is wiped out. Right. And so if you're gifting something while you're still alive, you have to be careful because the stock may have gone up, and they won't get the full value, the twenty thousand dollar value. They'll only get eighteen five because there's going to be if you're gifting it then there's going to be taxes due of, in this example of $1,500. So you just have to be careful if you're gifting versus, you know, holding on to an asset. Um, which assets do you want to gift? Which assets do you want to simply hold on to? Good point. Good. You know, and here's, you know, gifting, gifting an appreciated stock. When you pass away, they get the full value. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Could be a charitable donation or it could just be to your heirs or, or whatever. So long-term care, a potential need for long-term care, what would happen to your estate if you needed long-term care for an extended period? So the only thing here um, I wanted to, to mention is that, um, you know, uh, here in Michigan, I think uh, nursing home is about $100,000 a year right now. Right. You know, Maybe a little bit more than that. Um, if you had four years at $100,000 a year, that would certainly chip away at your uh, at your nest egg to the tune of $400,000. And so um, it's always good to look into um, long-term care. I would say long-term uh, care policies are not for the uh, poor people and they're not for the very, very rich people. They're really for the people kind of somewhere in the middle that, um, you know, they don't want to, you know, what would happen if you had a $400,000 hit to your nest egg and you pass, then you pass away and then your spouse is left with the nest egg minus $400,000. So it's certainly something, um, a long-term care policy is certainly something to look into down the road. Right, 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 right. Uh, 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 so basic distribution, um, Mark, you want to talk about intestacy? Yeah, you don't want to be there. Um, <laughs> in, in, intestacy was the prior side. That's with someone who does not have any will or trust. Uh, so basically, the, the state of Michigan tells you what's going on. So you and I certainly don't want to be subject to the state of Michigan rule. So you, you completely want to uh, avoid the state of Michigan telling you what to do. And on the will versus trust, you know, 100%. I would cross off will. You 100% would want to trust compared to a will because trust avoid probate. Okay. 
The example on jointly held property is that, Jeff, I think both you and I would see, uh, you know, someone, you know, trust their children, they'll put them on the bank account, they'll put them on the house, okay? So it does avoid probate, so that's a good thing. On the other hand, which we have to discuss, <laughs> on the other hand, if your children own your house, if, they, if they're on your bank account, and let's say they're in a car accident, uh, I, and I'm not trying to make up any stories here, there's a divorce, if they own your assets, you know, they own them for, you know, convenience, they have access to, to them, but if they own your assets, good buy your assets if your children have a, a creditor. If it was instead in the trust, the children have no ownership interest during your life. So I'm saying people come in, Jeff, like they do to you, and they say, I trust my children, they're on the deed. That uh, I, I know they trust their children, and I'm not questioning that, but there's a better way to do this you know, with a, uh, you know, with a trust versus jointly held. Uh, right. So so if they get into a car accident and they get oh. sued, then they start coming after any and all assets. They own it. They own it. Uh, the advantage and disadvantage of a beneficiary designation, the advantage, it's automatic. Um, so let's say you know, it doesn't matter. You, you, could, you could put a beneficiary designation uh, on a bank account, on life insurance, uh, on an IRA uh, so let's say it says to my husband, my wife, my children, uh, that the beneficiary is automatic. So that, that's, you know, to one extent, it's good. To another extent, it's bad. Because if it's automatic and your children are in a divorce, that's a bad deal. So we recommend, and Jeff and I have done this 100 times, that the beneficiary designation, instead of saying children, would say trust. And then your trust would have all the protections that basically says, you know, 20 pages later, you know, don't pay a child if they're in the middle of the divorce. So the beneficiary designation uh, is automatic, but that could be good and bad. Better to be, better to say the beneficiary designation is to the trust. Right. So we talked a little bit about talk, this, yeah, we talk, know, yeah. the problems with intest um, intestacy. You know, you, you really don't want this, the state of Michigan deciding who's, who's going to get your kids, um, who's going to get your money. Um, it may work out fine, but <laughs> I don't want to lose control, you know. No, um, you know even, even if I'm dead, I don't want to lose control. <laughs> you know, and then you got fees and taxes and probate and guardianship of the mind. You know, it's determined by the court, you know. Yeah. You're just running into all kinds of issues. Um, you know, control, a will enables you to control distribution of the estate. Name a guardian for your minor children, which is, I think, what most parents want to do. Uh, potentially reduces fees, taxes, probate. Um, I don't know about the, the will avoiding probate, but um, it'll, it, it's better than not having anything at all. A will be better than having zero because you don't yeah. want to uh, die intestate. Uh, that's without a will. Yeah. But uh, the, the will, as it says here, goes to probate. You and I do not want a will when there's a choice to have a trust. Yeah. Um, an executor. We talked a little bit about this. You know, choose someone who has the time, resources, the ability. Um, select an individual who's capable. You know, working with an attorney, negotiating a little bit. And this doesn't have to be an expert, but, you know, they have a little bit of uh, maybe business sense or, you know, they just aren't, aren't, they aren't intimidated. Um, by choosing a spouse or a friend, you may be able to help reduce administrative costs. In some cases, people decide to, you know, choose a professional. Well, there's going to be, if you choose a professional, then you're going to, you're going to pay a little bit for that professional to, to handle things. But in some cases, they don't have a choice. They don't have anybody that they can truly trust. And so they decide to uh, choose a professional. And I get this um, question a lot, um, that uh, uh, do you just have to have one person? Uh, you could have uh, two people being, uh, you know, co executors, co-trustees. Co co uh, right. The other thing that's important is that what happens, you know, in real life, so to speak, let's say uh, you name a, uh, it could be even your, your children, whoever it is, you, 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 you name a, an executor, a trustee. But it's important to name the backup 
because the I mean the primary one doesn't have to die. But let's say um, I know if any of you have worked as a trustee, it's not a fun job. Sometimes uh, you know trustees you know, decide it doesn't fit them, and they you know do not accept the trusteeship. So it, it's completely a right question if the trustee decides not to accept. We are going to be talking in our meetings. Who's the backup? Um, you want to control that. You want to have the answer to that. And the, the the executor could be stressed out and not able to be able to. Hundred hundred different reasons. You you yeah. want to really look at if the trustee. If you and I are a trustee, uh, uh, you know maybe it, it you know we we accept it at that point. Is it the time of death of, of someone? Or if we don't accept it, that's why we want to talk about it back up. Sure, that's important. Jointly held property. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, Mark, you got any additional comments about joint tenancy? No, I'm just saying it's it, it's common when people they come into the office with everything in joint. They don't leave the office that way because we we typically would uh, be talking about a trust. But it's the most common way of uh, handling things. And then when people talk Jeff to you and me, a trust is going to be much more flexible. Right. And better protection for the parents. Right. Okay. You know, a change well, in property sure. title could trigger tax consequences to assets maybe lost. You know, right. They run right. Look, at, look at that bullet point, the middle one. It's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So um, contracts, life insurance, annuities, pensions, retirement plans. Um, they, they all have uh, beneficiary designations. But one of the things that Mark uh, mentioned was that, uh, you know, there's no, no reason why the uh, trust couldn't be um, the beneficiary designation. Because if you have everything in the trust, then, um, then it takes care of that. So yeah. make sure your um, beneficiary, beneficiary designations are appropriate if you are divorced make sure that your ex-wife or ex-husband is not on the um, beneficiary designation. Uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, I believe if you have uh, uh, an ex-spouse on a beneficiary designation and you um, have started up a trust, that if they have that ex-spouse on the beneficiary designation, that, that takes precedent, does it not? Yeah, the ex-spouse would win. Yeah, so there you go. I think, uh, the big picture, if there's a change in circumstances, you know, you want to review it. This is Jeff, I know what you and I would do is make sure the beneficiary designations are, are correct. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's important. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. This is a, this is an important concept. So per stirpes, um, I'll talk about that real quick. So if you, let's say you have multiple children, and those multiple children are adults, and you you list those multiple children as the beneficiaries, then you um, typically, most people want to list per stirpes. So what happens then is if you list per stirpes, then what happens then, each of those three children may have children, and if they should predecease you, and then you die, then the money goes to those children. If you don't put in per stirpes, what will happen is, um, so, so the money would go to the grandchildren of that, of that child. If you don't have per stirpes in there, then what will happen is the money will go to the other two adult children. Correct, Mark? No, no that's 100% right. So it, it's, it's always a question every single meeting forever that the, you know, God forbid a child dies before you, where do you want the assets to go? And, uh, you know, almost always, but not 100%, always, but almost always they say down the family line. Right. Yeah, that's been so my experience as well. Too. Yep, so that's, we, 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 we hit this head on in every meeting. Right. And so per capita would be exactly, you know, the opposite, like I said. Um, uh, you know, it goes to the remaining children. Um, so, um, and then trust strategies. 
Mark, you want to dive in here? Yeah, I think the most important thing by far are the fundamentals, which the assets have to be titled in, in, into the trust uh, to, to make it work. And I, I don't want to just uh, say those words and go on, uh, but Jeff, you said it right in the beginning, is that it's one thing to have a trust. The trust is like a bucket. The fundamentals really are to make sure the assets go in, into the trust by beneficiary designation, by ownership. The advanced strategies are really questions that come up. Do you allocate, how do you allocate which assets to which share? And we ad address that uh, sometimes if there's a house, cottage, sometimes uh, we let the trustees decide, but that's, uh, that's something we would want to address. So, so and in our trust, yeah, go ahead. I, well, I was just gonna say, um, and I'm not sure where we're at with this, but this diagram, I think, is 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 yeah. This very, is a, this very is a very simple trust example. Yeah, a great great picture. And so, you as the grantor grant your assets to the trust. You are also the trustee in most cases. You're almost always the trustee in most cases, and so you're always in control of the trust. And then the trust dictates where the assets are going to go to the beneficiaries. Completely. Yeah. Uh, I like that diagram because it's simple for me. It, 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 it supports the fact you said right in the beginning, you've got to throw the assets into the trust. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great slide. Yeah. I like that slide for simple minds like mine. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's an important slide. Well, you know, testamentary trust uh, versus a living trust. I think you almost always want a living trust, right, Mark? Well, you would 100% always want a living trust. A testamentary trust, you know, you still see some of those, but it, it, no one knowingly wants it. It's a trust created under a, a will. It basically says, uh, you know, come get me probate court. Because it goes to probate. <laughs> so no one knowingly would prepare a testamentary trust. Yeah. We'll okay. skip, kind of skip over that. Revocable versus living trust. I think that's an important concept. Yeah. Mark. People want to change their trust. And so what Jeff, you said, the, the trust during your life will be seamless because typically, like almost 100% of the time, I mean, you, you control it. So it's going to be seamless to you. But at the time of death, it'll be really helpful, as it says, to avoid probate and provide for the proper distribution to your family. Right, right. Okay. Irrevocable trusts. Yeah, I typically what you, you don't you don't see as much of those, uh, but an irrevocable trust are giving assets away. So someone on that prior slide who had now over eleven million, we would throw the excess to an irrevocable trust. So the advantage and disadvantage, <laughs> it just doesn't apply that much anymore. But the right, advantage yeah. is you don't own the the advantage is out of your estate, but the disadvantage is you don't own the assets. Right. But you hardly ever see that, but it is a, a, a tool in our toolbox, but it's typically for those estates uh, who are over the exemption. Which, or is, which is 11, uh, over 11 million for one person and over 22 million for... It's a big, it's a really big number. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, for very, years. very large estates nowadays. It, it right. didn't always used to be, but it is now. Right. Uh, Special so, needs... Yeah, that's um, it's a question we ask. Uh, so uh, if there's potential for government benefits for a, a, a child or someone, uh, the, the trust has to be drafted to uh, ad address that to maintain the government benefits. Um, we had a, a mother who lived a normal life expectancy died, but had a, a special needs adult son, you know, bought a, uh, it felt really good, bought, I think a $2 million policy, uh, put it in a special needs trust and it gave her the, the, the comfort level during her life that her son would be taken care of. But that was a special needs trust. All right. And um, I don't think we see incentive trust very often, but I do have an example of a friend of mine who his brother, his brother uh, contracted uh, cancer. Um, it was terminal. He had an incentive trust drafted up because he had a lot of money and his son um, had a major drug problem. And so 
the incentive here was he was not going to get any money um, until he uh, beat his drug problem for X number of years. In the meantime, there was a uh, um, uh, trustee that uh, was instructed to only uh, pay for his apartment and pay for food and uh, those types of things until um, he was able to meet the requirements of the trust. So they do exist. Um, I think they're fairly far, few and far between, um, but that's where an incentive trust would come into play. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so um, last survivor life insurance policy, um, sometimes those are good for um, couples that um, the policy does not pay out until the second uh, survivor passes um, and then the money can go then to, uh, to you know, typically children, um, you know, adult children or whatever, but it's a second to die policy, um, last survivor, what we call second to die or last survivor policy. Um, just so that you know what that is. Tax uh, or estate plan should be reviewed periodically. You know, we recommend every three years or so. Things change. Uh, laws are changing fast right now. So um, that's something to be aware of. And so, um, first of all, I want to, I'm, I'm truly honored um, that uh, you joined us here today. Uh, we want to keep it within an hour. We want to keep the presentation within an hour. And um, some of you are clients, current clients. Some of you are uh, uh, not clients at the moment. But I am truly honored to, to have you spend uh, time with us today uh, in your, you know, your evening. You know, maybe you raced around to, to uh, get dinner going and everything else, uh, you know, just to join us here today. So I did want to, um, hopefully you can see this poll. I did want to um, uh, do a, a poll. Um, we did uh, at the beginning say that uh, we would offer free consultation, uh, both with me and, uh, and Mark. And so here's the poll. Um, would you like a free consultation with Jeff Brindley? Would you like a free consultation with Mark Landau? Just mark those. I'm only gonna have this up for about uh, 10 seconds or so. And if you could mark those, that'd be great. Um, I think you'll see the poll right now come up. Um, so uh, you can answer that. The next slide is also going to have my contact information on it and Mark's contact information on it. So if you just want to call one of us or, or whatever, um, you can do that. So I'll go ahead and end, end the poll here. Um, in about uh, five, four, three, two, one. The other thing I wanted to mention too is um, is that uh, we do have this recorded. So if there is somebody that um, you would like to have this recording, maybe they couldn't make it today. Um, uh, certainly we can send them the recording. The other option too is you probably don't want to hear the whole thing again. <laughs> but if there's a if there's a concept that you just wanted to re-listen to, you know, certainly we can send that uh, recording to you. You can just go to that particular area of interest and re-listen to that as well. Um, so here's Mark's information. Here's my information. A lot of you have my information. And again, uh, we thank you for, uh, for joining us, taking the time out of your day to, uh, to join us here today. Mark, any uh, parting words? No, I appreciate being involved. And uh, I really want to thank the participants for sitting in and taking time out of their day to uh, hear what we've had to say. And uh, if there's questions, uh, you know, 100% uh, give Jeff or, or, or me a call and uh, we, we would be available. Uh, Thanks again for your time and I hope you have a great evening. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.